Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today, we welcome back Vijay Rajput. He's an internal medicine physician. He last came on a podcast talking about his article, Top 10 Things New Interns Should Do. We invite him back today to give an update on that article. Vijay, welcome back to the show. Kevin, good morning, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate giving me the opportunity to update or add some new information related to the article we published on your website as a blog. All right. So we last spoke two years ago. Any changes since that two years in terms of your tips and advice on what new interns and residents should do to succeed? Yeah. So last few years, I've been pondering this issue of empathy and compassion. So let me dive back. For the last 25 years, at least in medical education and clinical health care, we've been telling physicians and students and residents so more empathy. And then we also move to the compassion. But I would like to introduce the concept of kindness. So if you give me a few minutes, I want to make it our audience clear the difference between sympathy empathy, compassion, and kindness. So I will take a few minutes. Sympathy is just you showing individual superficially pity for you, right? I will just say, oh, sorry, without having that feeling or even a cognitive response to my brain. And a lot of time our students or people anytime say, take a history and say, oh, your parents, tell me about your family history and say, oh, my parents died. And my student will say, oh, sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. That sorry has no meaning. To me, the only time people should use sorry in a health profession, if you made a mistake, error, and a true apology should always have a sorry. So that's sorry. Empathy is really a conscious understanding, having an emotion or a response to the somebody who is going through, right? That's a cognitive response, emotional response, but that's only left up to the, you show that, the word we have used is, right? to fill in someone's shoes, right? Yeah. That's the word we commonly use it. So that's empathy. We've been teaching that empathy. We've been assessing student empathy. We are saying, oh, they come with a very great empathy first year, and then by fourth year, they lose all the empathy. We've been saying that. Compassion in a very simplistic mathematical way, empathy plus action to alleviate somebody's suffering. That's compassion in a very easy way. You have to have a desire or at least attempt to alleviate somebody's suffering. That's a compassion. Now, the kindness, that's a very interesting way. We, we use the word kindness all the time. But the kindness is any benevolent act or a gesture where you want to respond to somebody with help. But that opposite person doesn't have to be in a distress, doesn't have to be suffering through anything. So the kindness is, you don't, first thing, you don't need any emotional attachment with the person you want to show kindness, and that person doesn't have to be in a vulnerable situation. And we have a good number of people in healthcare and education that we can show each other a kindness, right? So that's the, I want to make a little bit shift in our education and the healthcare that maybe we can dive a little bit more kindness. And I can give you some examples. Right. If if you are an intern or a student walking in a first day or a, in the in your patient's room, and a patient is ringing the bell, and either looking for a urinal bottle, or I believe my elderly patient, you know, old days they couldn't open the milk carton to pour the milk on a on a breakfast tray on a cereal, you help them out. You bring that urinal bottle. That's a kindness, right? You are you are not doing anything. They're not suffering distress. So there are a lot of opportunity we miss out and we don't teach our students and our residents and our faculty. So I, I'm really now pushing this, my mission, that let's talk more about kindness. We should show compassion. There is no question about it because people who are suffering and distress, but let's spread more kindness among each other. So are you finding that in general, new residents and students that you see, do you have to teach kindness? Uh, it seems like that it should be relatively innate. You gave that example of the patient ringing the bell and you give them a urinal or whatever you need and, and just out of kindness. Does that need to be taught? You, you know, 
Kevin, that's a good question. I used to think, yeah, we don't need to teach that. They should have learned or they should know. But the answer is no, I think we need to. Because I think in a healthcare and medical student, we give them a fixed job description, right? And they've been taught now all this competency. And within a competency, it said, oh, you're breaking the bad news is one of your competency. Oh, you have this interpersonal communication. Let me tell you, we, I've never seen the word kindness in there. We have been, I've seen the words empathy and now lately been compassion. So answer, yeah, we, we haven't, most of the resident, most probably most of my Gongo resident will say, Dr. Rasu, that's not my job description. They are medical assistants. They are supposed to do. They are not doing their job. And I said, ah, that's not true. They are small gestures you can do anytime to anybody within your profession. Uh, people surrounding you, I, I think that elevate the all level of uh, engagement and a well-being. I truly believe if you're more kind, you're likely to get more engaged, you will reciprocate, and the well-being also get improved. So how do you go about teaching kindness to your students? Do you have a lecture? Do you do it through actions and and they would model after you? So how would you go about teaching your students kindness? You said the right word there, role modeling, Kevin. That's the best way. I mean, I can throw a lecture. I have written a paper now lately on the kindness to bring in medical education. We need more role model. Because if you don't have a good role model at the bedside, or you see people, then they are very less likely they will embrace it. So I completely with you. We, we need to teach them and advise and guide them and tell them what is the kindness. But at the end of the day, if we have a more role model in every interprofessional level, the nursing or in the surgeons and a physician, that's the best way to. And there are several examples. And, and students watch us. Trust me, they see us all the time. And uh, I still remember when when I used to bring. I, I this is my uh, this. If you divulge in you know, one minute, every time when I'm on a service, and there's always one patient might have a birthday coming up out of your 15 patients. And in, in any hospital, I can tell you one or two patients a birthday. And I will just take out $20 and give it to my resident student and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to bring a cake from cafeteria or you can bring from outside. And we'll just go to the patient bedside. Even if it's a diabetic patient, we will bring the cake. It's a Dr. Atwood, I want to bring the cake. And we celebrate the birthday. It's just simple gesture, right? That even I have given a many times a couple of dollars for my, even my IV drug patient who said, Dr. Atwood, I need a bus fare. I will take her and give her a couple of dollars. My resident will say, Dr. Rajput, how do you know that he's not going to use that patient, that money, just go and buy the drug? And I said, I can't worry about that because at this moment, if a patient, I have to trust the patient, I have to believe in this patient. So yes, yeah, so there are small gestures of kindness we can show to each other at any level. I think that will help everybody in the healthcare. So tell me a story about how these gestures of kindness how does that help patients? Give us a story about how it made that appreciable difference in a patient's life. I will tell you, Kevin, all my career, every time when I've shown a kindness, and if even if I made a mistake with my patient, they will trust me. The, mm -hmm. the, the best way of building the trust to my patient is all about caring for them, caring with kindness. Besides listening to them and going extra mile, and this is I I have thought in a in a sort of a a thought pillar in my mind is going extra mile for people who are in front of you. Yeah. That extra mile, which is means this is not part of your job description. I think this is a real problem in our com country community in healthcare. Everybody said, oh, I have this job description. If I deviate from job description. I might get in trouble. And my answer is, no, nah, these are something you have to just go extra mile and help everybody in surrounding. And, and that's also connected to the word practical wisdom. Uh, people talk about wisdom, but the practical wisdom is deviating from the norm and helping the person in front of you. That's a practical wisdom or a phonesis. So that's, that's how I will say we, we should do more. So let's talk about role models and you and your other fellow attending physicians. 
sometimes it's difficult to model kindness with all the frustrations and obstacles and bureaucracy that you have to deal with. Sometimes kindness is lower down on the list. So how do you have that presence to demonstrate that kindness on particularly bad days when you're undergoing a lot of stress, you have difficult patient encounters, you have difficult administrative encounters, there's so much more on your mind. How do you make room to to think to yourself, hey, I also need to model kindness to my students as well? Yeah, absolutely. So there are two things you have to do it by end of the day. So let's say you had behaved badly and you realize it that it, that incident did not go well with a patient or a nurse because you are in that moment. And we all we all are human beings and likely to stress out. If you have that situation, there are two things has to happen. The person you have shown your microaggression, micro incivility or micro they need some sort of apology or at least say, you know, I put you in this situation, my apology. That, that has to happen. And the second thing, the people who are observing you and you are the role model, you require at least five or 10 minutes debriefing at the end of the day and say, what do you think what happened that incident where we went in this patient room? What do you think what I did? And you have to have that easy and at least guts to tell your learner and not to feel, say, oh, how I'm going to look now? Because they're going to say, Dr. Rajput is not good. Mm -hmm. No, actually, they will. you will get elevated. So I've done that. If I went and did something wrong, like I, I, I'll give you an example. Recently, and this happened in a, in a Zoom meeting with somebody we were interviewing as a five faculty member with another faculty member. And one of my faculty members have asked the question, which truly in any book would have been seen as a microaggression. The the interviewer really sensed it, but he or she did not respond that I need to set up another meeting, debrief my faculty and said, what happened here? And I have to tell my other people. And so it, so the end of the day, you need to close the incident because that's the only way the, the learner will learn and say, oh, I really realized that that has happened. And I think they will role model the same thing. And I, I, I'm assuming that should happen on the same day. It should not happen after a week because then people will forget. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier when you mentioned your mentoring and teaching new students and residents that you have formal courses on, on empathy, or you said that empathy can be taught. So in your program and within the academic medical education community, how does one teach empathy to new students and residents? So the empathy, going back to whether it's a nature or nurture, and I, I think my feeling is, is both. Mm -hmm. You need to have a small basic substrate with you. I cannot fully suddenly say, Kevin, here is a script. You are an empathetic physician up front now. But you can build on it. If they have a basic stuff, then you can build on it. And the building can happen in every format and every way. I mean, nowadays we do through the standardized patient in early education nowadays across the medical school. And a clock subside, you really want to make sure the, the near peer learning also show the same empathy. So the interns and the residents and the fellows, if that happens, and then you bring it that as a part of the discussion, I, I think a lot of debriefing and a reflection is an important part of learning of empathy and compassion. Without that, I don't think we can learn just by reading the books. So as I said earlier, we last spoke about two years ago. You were giving uh, a similar topic on this podcast, tips new interns should do. So how have these new interns been over the last few years? Have you noticed any trends among the new medical residents that you're seeing today? So... I, I think the challenge we are having right now in a discussion in the national level is, and you very much aware, is about the burnout and a well-being. And we are all worried about their early burnout in their internship and a residency. And I think the challenge is that there are two things. We do not engage them fully, providing the psychological safety right, and a psychological safety to handle the difficult, stressful situation, the one which I will describe, they need to learn how to manage three M's in their early or during the residency 
is I call one is micromanagement. They they want autonomy as they become internal resident. Mm -hmm. But you and I know there are physicians who just do not have that capability to provide enough freedom or autonomy to the resident to, and they keep on hovering around and micromanage. When I was a program director, every time few residents would say, Dr. Rajput, how you can make this my this faculty less micromanage me? Mm -hmm. I can, I'm doing a great job. Very difficult, very difficult. And sometimes it's very easy for a micromanager supervising physician to say, Vijay, I was doing for patient safety and a quality indicator, right? Easy way to say. So that's the one day I need to help them and we need to help how to navigate the micromanaging support. The microaggression part is, is, is the reason microaggression and micro incivility is never rise up to intervention by leadership or organization level. They are very subtle. They're very almost inconsequential Mm -hmm. and inconsiderate small, small behavior. And all these three are in the eye of the beholder, right? It is always in the eye of the beholder. The resident, the students, and the younger faculty can perceive, but the person who is doing it usually doesn't even sometimes recognize or doesn't mm -hmm. have any sight that he's portraying all these three behavior. So what we need is a dialogue and train our early intern and resident that they're going to come across them. I, this is very difficult that we're going to eradicate. I, I will, I will be <laughs> naive if I say we will be able to eradicate micromanager, microaggression, and micro incivility. But we need to prepare our learner how to handle that. And I think we should also help the our younger physician that how they can overcome and not show this three. I call 3M behaviors, mm -hmm. which is many times is only in the eye of the beholder. And do you have any sessions that can help new interns manage those 3Ms? So it's a very early, I have come up with this. So we are putting through some workshop in the national level to the educator. And so it's becoming part of the faculty development. A lot of people have been teaching. Uh, Microaggression has been has been taught for the last 10 years since the paper first came from Colombia. Christine Pora have written a book on incivility in a healthcare or any organization. So there's a lot of discussion there, but it's not been put together in the medical education. I'm hoping the next few years, I will have some more research and more faculty development and disseminate this as a more of a learner to understand how to navigate and a faculty, how to mitigate in their own behavior. And you mentioned burnout, especially in early career physicians. What is your program or other medical educators do to help mitigate early burnout? Because as you know, it's burnout is prevalent throughout medical education, throughout the careers of physicians. What are some ways that we can mitigate that early on? So I, I think we all do, which everybody is doing is we can all do meditation, yoga, exercise, healthy eating and habit. But my personal belief, the only way we can prevent burnout and avoid burnout is a meaningful engagement with your patient and find the joy taking care of the patient. If we don't, and that's also we need to role model, the joy taking care of the patient. Because if you don't find the joy what you're doing it, doesn't matter what we do and help them with the other part of the world mm -hmm. or other part of their life, they will still don't feel the burnout. That's difficult because as we just discussed, there are stressful situations and there are stressful days and there are stressful patients, but we all need to, at the end of the day, find that joy by taking care of the patient. We can get at least mitigate or prevent the burnout. We're talking to Vijay Rajput. He's an internal medicine physician, and we're following up on his Kevin MD article, Top 10 Things New Interns Should Do. This is an update podcast on something that he came on the show two years for. Vijay, we'll end with some of your take-home messages to the Kevin MD audience. So my take-home message, Kevin, we should now talk about kindness also along with the compassion and empathy when we talk empathy and compassion in education and clinical care and, and disseminate and find a way to opportunity to show kindness to each other. And I also like to find a way to manage these three M, which I call the 
micromanagement, microaggression, and microincivility, and prepare our young learners, early learners, how to navigate that, and the faculty and the clinician should learn how to mitigate or diminish in their behavior and their day-to-day -day workplace. And I think that will be my message to, that will help to prevent the burnout and we all have at least enhance our well-being. And at the end of the day, our patient is also benefited in a big way. Vijay, thank you so much for coming on the show again and sharing your time, insight, and perspective. Kevin, thank you for having me and have a good day.